ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the national anthem of St. Please be seated. If in the light of things you fade, real yet wanly withdrawn to our determined and appropriate distance, like the moon left on all night among the leaves, May you invisibly delight this house, O oh star, doubly compassionate, who came too soon for twilight, too late for dawn. May your pale flame direct the worst in us through chaos with the passion of plain day. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this evening's Master of Ceremony, for the Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture 2021, Mr. Dylan Norbert Inglis. Her Excellency Dame Paulet Louise, Governor General Emeritus and Chairperson of the Nobel Laureate Festival Committee, Senator Honorable Fortuna Bellrose, Minister in the Ministry of Tourism with Responsibility for Culture and Creative Industries. Sen Senator Honorable Dr. Adrian Oje, our feature lecturer. Sigrid Nama Walcott, our invited guest, members of the media, good evening. My name again is Dylan Norbert Inglis, and I have been given the distinct honor of serving as your master of ceremony this evening. To say that the world currently sits in a state of flux is an understatement. As a pandemic serves as the backdrop for worldwide instability, volatility, and discontent, leaving some heavy-hearted, some heartbroken, and yet others empty-hearted, I dare say that we, as a people, should feel constrained today more than at any point in our recent history to look within to understand who we are, where we have come from, and where we are going. It is with this in mind that I reference the almost prophetic opening words of Derek Walcott's Love After Love. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at each other's welcome. With that, let me welcome this small, socially distant, and thusly not too intimate audience, as well as our virtual audience, to the annual Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture. I know that you are all eager to partake in what I assure you will be an entertaining and mentally stimulating evening. Cognizant of that, let me again welcome you and advance this evening's program by introducing a presentation by Catherine Atkinson, Solite Odlam and Lisa Dublin. Voices of the underground coming on the rebound. The saltfish bleeds brine and softens overnight. 
The next morning, you rise to rinse and remember you dreamed of rain. At the sink, you scrape the scales silver in the white March sun. They stick to your hands like sweethearts. A rasping wind carries the counsel of the mangroves up the valley. You finger through the swollen flesh, feeling for the line of the bone. I said this there. Like prayer beads, flake along the grain of the fish into a bowl, expectant as the parched earth. Hands oiled, you score the fig from after four. Slip your thumb through the seam to peel the stubborn green casing from the starch. You put it to boil. Sweep the sweat from your head. The pan on the fire is fragrant with coconut oil, onion, peppers, and thyme salvaged from the Kawem Grudge yard. Fry the fish and serve with fig and cucumber seasoned with cruel vinegar. You sit. Eat. Bougainvillea dances at your window. You pray for rain. Voices of the underground coming on the rebound. Homebound, dedicated to a KO. The vision always came first always would. And could I understand without flinching, without the pinched face and brittle tones, every time the crunch came and punched a hole through the chipboard of my patience? The vision always came first. But that's what I really loved, your unrelenting drive to keep the world outside alive, your calling, now bittersweet driving us apart on the inside. The vision always came first, coveting even the minuscule crumbs and our living was hard, marred as any piecemeal love. But tolerable, at least. A few broken vases, some jagged shards, making amends, making do, making love to get us through those fragile nights. Still, the vision always came first, even with the generous gift of forgiveness, even with our mellow made-up mornings, even with a weekend away, a negligee. But always, you must dash and disappear to make right the wrongs you didn't make. And I would trust nothing less. Man with a cause, because my mind comprehends even when my heart contracts. And the vision always came first. Thirsty for you, bursting breathless into our space, leaving a mess behind, closed doors, and I know that you tried to live undivided. While I lived in division, lying to myself, lying next to you, and it was almost enough at times, just enough the way it was. Until one day, I found myself homeless in our home. Nothing more to say, nothing more to heal, nothing more to feel, nowhere to hide in an ambivalent sky, just waiting and waiting and wanting the inevitable call to store the inevitable. Voices of the underground coming on the rebound. Hello. Don't ask me how I'm doing. I have stopped spinning, slowing to breathe my own breath. 
behind a mask. Masking, forcing, unmasking, everything that can be shaken is broken along backbone or strengthened along fault lines. Darkness producing so much light refracted in a hundred places and in people's half faces, eyes revealing what the mouth finally can no longer hide. Six feet apart is a new six feet under, death to hustle, death to grind, death to busy, death to noise. I am breathing the breath of my own sin. I am breathing the sound of my own spin. I am breathing the sting of my own hate. I am breathing the stain of my own pride. I taste me behind the mask. Hello, do not ask me how I'm doing. I have stopped trying, resigned to a reckless resetting behind the mask. Take me as I have become this time for the rest of our lives. This reset is a mindset shift to normalize the normal with the burial of the victims and the conjuring of browning dreams. Everyday actions turned into petitions for life. Six feet apart to make you see you've been ghosting yourself, breathing your own breath to confirm your mess. I taste my terror without the companion crowd. I hear the scream of my hidden name. I feel the cold wind of my end game. I touch a sticky darkness behind the mask. Hello, do not ask me how I'm doing. I am becoming nothing and everything behind this mask. Eyes watching, ears screaming, don't touch, don't breathe, don't approach, don't cleave. Go to work, stay home, go to school, stay home, go to die, stay home. Reset, pay down debt, grab watch again, embrace the tech, zoom your coffee, FaceTime grandmother's dying, stream your guts from a darkened basement. I can't believe this is happening. Even the weddings will soon have a close. Hello, doesn't matter how I'm doing. I might have stopped dying, though there's no living yet. There's no ending yet. Only the promise of anything and nothing behind the mask. Voices of the underground coming on the rebound. Beautiful artistic depictions of us as a people. I now invite Rashad Joseph to treat us to a musical interlude. I set this death by fire. Hot gospeler has leveled all but church sky. I wrote the tale by tallow of the city's death by fire. Under the candle's eye that smoked in tears, I wanted to tell in more than wax of faiths that were snapped like wire. All day I walked abroad among the rubble tales, shocked at each wall that stood on the street like a liar. Loud was the bird-rocked sky, and all the clouds were bales, torn open by looting and white in spite of the fire. By the smoking sea where Christ walked, I asked, why should a man wax tears when his wooden world fails? In town, leaves were paper, but the hills were a flock of faiths. To a boy who walked all day, each leaf was a green breath. Rebuilding a love I thought was dead as nails. Blessing the death and the baptism by fire.
an introduction through this short video. Adrian Auger, artist, economist, and cultural entrepreneur, represents a unique combination of attributes resolved into a single sustainable existence. He has achieved this by working assiduously over many years as a practitioner of his art. As an investor on his sector and as a creator of opportunity for others. A respected policy advocate at local and regional level. He has consistently sought to inspire, validate and empower others through his work and public service. He has lectured in secondary schools on language and communication. He has written featured articles on St. Lucian artists and the creative environment. He is the pioneer of the use of local cultural iconography in carnival and theater. He created the open mic program Feedback, dedicated to young performing artists. He initiated and hosted the radio program In the Public Interest and for 10 years conducted workshops for young writers competing in the performance poetry competition at Word Alive Literary Festival. Besides excelling in arts, economics and business, he has demonstrated by example that hard work, persistence and dedication to excellence are enduring values which result in relevant and productive synergies. Such is his ethic that he has over several years devoted himself and his own capital to the fulfillment of such worthy initiatives as the creation of the Lighthouse Theatre, St. Lucia's first dedicated performance space. The Factory Creative Arts Centre, an open-door incubator project for multi-talented young artists. And Samans Park, a municipal dump transformed into a community green space for the hosting of state productions festivals and concerts, and Warehouse 11, a creative community space. His creative offerings to the region and the world include costume design and production at the ICC World Cup opening ceremony in Jamaica, the design and production of St. Lucia's signal presentation, Urban Drift, which premiered at Queen's Hall, Port of Spain, Trinidad service to the Interim Festival Directorate for Carifesta. The highly acclaimed stage production, Naval String at the World Festival of Art and Culture in Dakar, Senegal. The creation myth, Yirinora story and its sequel, Trumase, which toured Dublin and Guadeloupe respectively. The St. Lucia story, commissioned to mark the 40th anniversary of St. Lucia's independence and Afula Bay, presented in Taipei, Taiwan 2019. Oje provides employment opportunities through his events company, Landmark Events, and his work as a producer with the St. Lucia Business Award and components of the St. Lucia Jazz and Arts Festival, such as Jazz on the Square, Hot Couture, Rapture, and the Icon Concert Series. Most importantly, Oje's personal and professional development has been inclusive. He has taken many young performers on tour to London, Dublin, Guadeloupe, Jamaica, Trinidad, Boston, St. Kitts, Senegal, Martinique and Taiwan contributing to their own personal and professional development. Oje's wider impact is perhaps best demonstrated through his unique skill set which bridges commerce and culture. This is exemplified in his such work assisting the government of Grenada with the design of a new cultural festival and in his recent regional service as co-chair of CARICOM Task Force on Development of Regional Cultural Industries. Your presenter for the 2021 Derek Walker Lecture, Senator the Honorable Dr. Adrian Auger. Ladies and gentlemen, the 
let me introduce again, Dr. Adrian Oje. Thank you, Mr. Master of Ceremonies, and thank you to the producers of the introduction, which is indeed um, quite thrilling to watch. <laughs> um, but thank you very much to those people who put that together. Um, we start this evening with an epigraph, and um, it is dedicated to Derek Walcott, and this evening, additionally, specially dedicated to the late Charles Cuddy. Evening, signal point. Nothing so meek, so immeasurably beholden as grief, which feels itself beyond relief and yet makes room for more. For this gift of gentle sailing into dusk, for his being here with us, sentient, silent, as evenings tilt, as oceans pivot, round this December evening. For daughters who will visit joy and the clatter of grandchildren upon a house grown too suddenly still amid the cresting traffic of sea breakers. For this porch, its shaded rim, his graying gaze beneath its shingled brim. For this unfolding gift of flannel sky and the seas wrinkled tin reflection. Through cataracts of clouds, we watched the timeline blurring and hemming its horizon and closing on our coast the roomy veils of sea spray, making ghosts of far off tankers fading too fast, too soon past signal point. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, Madam Minister, Sigrid Nama, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, guests, friends, media, audience out there, thank you for being with us for her kind invitation to deliver this 2021 Walcott Lecture, I am irrevocably grateful to Her Excellency Dame Perlette Louise, our Governor General Emerita and Chair of the Nobel Laureate Festival Committee. It is a singular honor, ma'am, to be so invited by someone who continues to hold such sway as an exemplar to us all, and no less as my former French teacher and school principal. She wrote to me several months ago when curfews were in effect, appointments non-existent, travel banned for the foreseeable future, and like a kid caught smoking behind the boys' washroom, my options for escape were extremely limited. Beyond her kind invitation, I would also like to credit her genius for focusing my attention on the profound and prophetic statement from which the title of this lecture is drawn. I am grateful for the boundaries that imposed, because as said in Stockholm in 1992 when Derek received the world's highest honor for literature, trying to capture Derek Walcott's oceanic work in a formula would be an absurd enterprise. I come to this assignment from dual perspectives. As economist and artist, I have labored in the happy shadows of both laureates, 
Sir Arthur's, because he is the father of development economics, which has been my métier since the age of 22. And Walcott's, because of my love affairs with literature, theater, painting, design, and carnival. The boundaries between these are often more fluid than we imagine, and when they merge, it is sheer magic. In both fields, I continue with unmitigated respect for their genius, dedication, their mastery. And many years ago, when I needed to resolve my own dilemma of being economist by day and artist by night, I drew on the fact that both had climbed to their respective pinnacles from the plateau of the St. Lucian landscape and since that same landscape nurtures me, there should be no forced choice between my two callings. While Sir Arthur was a more distant legend, Derek was a recurring presence, riding into our lives from summer to summer with his exotic band of multicolored, multi-talented characters, better known as the Trinidad Theatre Workshop. What struck me then, beyond mere talent, was their energy uncompressed, unsuppressed, explored, and expressed with confidence and conviction. They moved like the masters they sought to be and the master they sought to please, absorbed in their craft, built with fragments of the places they were from. Many of those friendships still endure, with Brenda Hughes, who played Tisbia, John Andrews, the lighting man, Adele Bino, always the dancer, Carol LaChapelle, choreographer, Wendell Man Warren, Helen Camps, and before their passings, Stanley Marshall, who played the quintessential Mijan, and the legendary Errol Jones, I first encountered as Macaque. Whenever Derek rode in, our local legends emerged from the woodwork, the veterans of the Old Arts Guild, an epicenter of anecdote and nostalgia, but less now, as the memories die. Derek's presence would draw them out like fireflies to an evening lamp. Kenneth Morplazy, Sixtus Jan Charles, Arthur Jakes Jacobs, Ruby York, MacDonald Dixon, Gandalf St. Clair, and a cast of other personalities who suddenly became larger than island life, vying to be re-engaged in his world of woods and wonder. Reunited as Derek's cast and crew, they staged such classics as Dream on Monkey Mountain, Tija and His Brothers in the Old Town Hall, and later the Joker of Seville in the Geist Banana Shed. The Haitian Earth was staged, an open-air concert at Mont Fortune in 1984 to mark the 150th anniversary of emancipation. And at age 24, I had the audacity to critically review Walcott. These were my introductions to the infinite possibilities of Caribbean theater, from which I have yet to recover. Before we launch our intrepid parog further out to sea, I must disclose that for the most part, my references to Derek's work this evening are drawn from selected poems, FSG 2007, and the Antilles, Fragments of Epic Memory also uh, Farrar, Strauss, and Guru, Giroux, sorry, 1980, 1992. Selected poems I have chosen for its span of Derek's work from In a Green Night, 1962, to Star Apple Kingdom, 1979, to Omerus, 1990, right up to Prodigal. It contains most of my Walcott favorites, and its editor, Professor Eddie Bohr, friend and scholar, has capped it with a wonderful introduction which greatly aids the task to which I have been assigned by a certain aforementioned Governor General. The equitable Eddie Bohr offers both a rigorous eye and a temperate understanding of both poet and poetry that makes a masterful selection of islands from the oceans of Derek's work. If in some cruel world you had to choose one volume of Walcott, this would be the one to keep by your bedside. And now to see the phrase, my God, my mic is slipping every so often. The phrase, a whole country, is lifted from Walcott's Nobel lecture, The Antilles, Fragments of Epic Memory. It appears in the end of a passionate evocation of Caribbean culture, history, landscape, where he exclaims how quickly it could all disappear. The passage ends with his lament that a morning could come in which governments might ask, 
what happened, not merely to the forest and the bays, but to a whole people. His worry is real. For many of us who live here, the fragility of our microcosm concerns us deeply. We feel a need to preserve our moorings to this place, the anchor of our being. I recall from memory rather than script Derek's assertion in an interview that you cannot separate Bob Marley from the mountains of Jamaica, nor any Caribbean poet from the sea. As a people, inseparable in so many ways from the landscape we inhabit, we depend on our environment for our physical and spiritual wholesomeness. We wish to belong. For us who are still trying to reconcile separation, transplantation, loss, restoration, it is important to belong. More so as the world intrudes with its untraceable money and unlimited appetite. We are afraid of this new empire, the rumored connivance and complicity. We feel betrayed. We cannot quite believe that our governments would wake in any morning, now or in any foreseeable future, to ask what happened to forest, bays, or even us. And this is tragic, because if it is true, it means that we have already begun to die. For those of us who see beach and forest and savanne and waterfall as communal spaces, who believe in the concept of the state as custodian, it is both incredible and sad that our battle for patrimony, relevance, for identity, for holding on to those shared spaces should bring us into such violent conflict with that very state which once stood as defender and protector. So we must ask, how did we come to be at war with our governments, with each other, tribally divided, instead of united in our common interest, against the strife and discord which dimmed her children's toil and rest? It is that same strife and discord we hear running in Walcott's warning, like a voice of the sea uncurling in an ancient conch, resonating with all the angst of recent headlines, how quickly it could disappear, and how it is beginning to drive us further into where we hope are impenetrable places, green secrets at the end of bad roads, headlands where the next view is not of a hotel, but of some long beach without a figure of the hanging question of some fisherman's smoke at its far end. If we are, as we proclaim in the opening line of that holiest of our songs, sons and daughters of St. Lucia who love the land that gave us birth, how is it that we cannot resolve this basic development dilemma of how to preserve our green secrets, our impenetrable spaces, while, while seeing to the economic needs of our people? This is an old, outdated conflict between development and conservation, which only the unenlightened still endure. There are examples aplenty of how to achieve balanced development, how to extract and retain responsible, how to attract, sorry, and retain responsible developers. There is global best practice in our own history books, new models in our own heads, and a reservoir of human decency in our hearts. With these at hand, finding solutions to the dilemma of a degrading environment is merely a matter of wanting better, demanding more, and having the mutual respect and resolve to bring solutions about. There is no real conflict here, only the illusion of false choices. Sensible resource utilization is driven essentially by the most fundamental principles of self-preservation. People who have thrived through five centuries of adversity do not now favor their own demise. They do not suddenly become senseless, reckless, spineless species, unable to choose between a dollar today for the few and a good fortune tomorrow for the many. So we must reverse this madness. For inspiration, we can return to Walcott, who opens the argument for substance over pretense, for reality over the postcard illusion that seems now to be our cage. He reminds us that, I quote, the Caribbean is not an idol. 
not to its natives. They draw their working strength from it organically, like trees, like the sea almond or the spice laurel of the heights. I have to be hopeful. I have to be hopeful that the wholeness and entirety of a people still ranks above real estate in the grand scheme of global development. I am hopeful that we are not too late in the debate of lives and livelihoods to return to good old-fashioned notions like equity, social democracy, and people-centered development, which is, in this era of Black Lives Matter, a larger conversation about economic dignity. I am even optimistic, and that is not easy for poets who move downhill from elation to despair in a metaphoric second. I am optimistic that we are not yet at that juncture in our journey, which Walcott foresaw, when people, though living, might cease to be whole in terms of their daily celebration of soul and spirit and shared consciousness, and therefore no longer a people in any meaningful sense of that word. Walker danced with dichotomy throughout his personal and professional life and was not discouraged by the coexistence of optimism and despair. He acknowledged the outpouring of poetry as a kind of dawn, the reward after the insomniac journey through the long night of history. And I quote, for every poet, it is always morning in the world. History, a forgotten insomniac night History and elemental awe are always our early beginning because the fate of poetry is to fall in love with the world despite history. It is with this love, in spite of history, in spite of everything that we would change about our island circumstances, that we must keep faith in the collective wisdom of the Caribbean. As disparate as we may seem, as oblivious as we sometimes choose to be, there are many who still feel that better can and will be done and feel a burning urgency regarding the need for fundamental change in our development trajectory. No matter how insufficiently observed, how inadequately expressed, there is still a healthy disquiet that craves equity and dignity that drives us through insomniac night towards dawn. This is why we stay. This is why we choose this place, as much for its promise as its ruinous embrace, the risk of the Midas touch. As Derek says in the Antilles, the secret is not to ask the wrong thing of it, not to demand of it an ambition it has no interest in. Perhaps that is our disconnect. The vision on the virtual drawing board, our promised transformation from wind-drift sand to pearl of the Caribbean, demands an ambition we have no interest in. Perhaps that is our disconnect. The prospect of employment has not delivered its promise. For many, it has neither reduced poverty nor increased happiness. More likely, it has divided our spirit between what we must do to survive and what we must do to recover, to reclaim, to restore, even a whore must rest. There are those who might argue that poets and painters are indulgent dreamers, disconnected from the imperatives of filling empty bellies. But clearly, Walcott's concerns transcend nostalgia, sentimentality, even art. His belief in the magic and mysticism of the Caribbean and St. Lucia does not blind him. In fact, our flawed fragility is fundamental to his view of our paradoxical world as something sacred, noble, worth preserving. Walcott helps us to see. Thank you. Walcott helps us to see the embodiment and sometimes the resolution of his own conflicted sense of history, identity, and purpose. He was our poet. And he saw more in us than we might be willing to see in ourselves. Such was his gift to us that while Marley was rocking on the transport stereo, he discovered us over and over again. And what he saw moved him to weep and to write. The beauty was humming the choruses quietly, the light on the plains of her cheek. The head was nothing else but heraldic, like a statue 
like a black de la Croix's liberty leading the people. Oh, beauty, you are the light of the world. His is a painful joy. It is that way with poets and with islands. The seductive beauty of the thing is its fatal flaw. In light of the world, Walcott is not simply talking about one woman on a grosily bus. He's talking about the collective us, a whole island, a whole people, his Caribbean, and the source of and solution to his own divided identity. To that world, he gives himself completely as to his heraldic figure who unites in her unassuming beauty all that is indescribably noble and elegant and fragile and fleeting. This is the fate of any earthbound beauty and all the more precious and tragic for being so. The voice that acknowledges her fading beauty, and he says gradually even that was going in the dusk, is the same voice that exclaims how quickly it could all disappear. That same voice heralds in the aftermath of the 1948 Castries fire that the hills were a flock of faiths. And from his first published, published collection in 1961, he proclaims, this island is heaven, away from the dust-blown blood of cities, for beauty has surrounded its black children and freed them of homeless ditties. Walcott's love of the Caribbean has almost always been painful, profound, prophetic. He was no blind poet trying to suspend a fading world in some single timeless frame, no. And so three decades after Green Knight, his 1992 evocation confirms his determination that we should make the most of what history has, however accidentally, left us. A history which does not so much make us, but empowers us to make ourselves into who we wish to be by reassembling our fragments of epic memory into some lovable whole. There is no pretension, no apology when he asserts in his Nobel lecture, our ability to condense, in a sense defeat, the hegemonic notions of history and relevance and value. And he writes, Consider the scale of Asia reduced to these fragments, the small white exclamations of minarets or stone balls of temples in the cane fields, and one can understand the self-mockery and embarrassment of those who see these rites as parodic, even degenerate. These purists look on such ceremonies as grammarians look on dialect as cities look on provinces and empires on their colonies. In other words, that the Caribbean is still looked at at illegitimate, rootless, mongrelized. No people there, no people, just fragments and echoes of real people, unoriginal and broken. That is how they look at us. The question for us then, three decades after Stockholm, and with one less soldier standing, is whether we have also come to think of each other with the same disregard, the same disdain, that combination of arrogance and ignorance which leaves us illegitimate and rootless and mongrelized. And if so, how the hell did we get here? In an article entitled The State of the St. Lucia Carnival, I argue that when the festival was moved out of its traditional pre-Lenten time slot, there was no discernible strategy to also transfer its cultural and creative soul. And I quote, as such, the festival grew without a clear rationale, dem remaining true to its roots for a few good years and then becoming gradually unmoored and increasingly adrift. Since then, the festival has succumbed to its darker, more lascivious and self-indulgent ego, losing sight and knowledge of its parallel potential for beauty, spectacle, art, creativity, and culture. And I suspect that this is the sort of state-sponsored degradation to which our culture has succumbed. 
believing that the value of celebration can be measured by the size of the event budget. However profligate, however oblivious to the history and humanity out of which the soul of the thing has sprung before government intervention modified its DNA. This leads to the unfortunate notion which I can never accept that citizens must seek permission from some authority to celebrate, to congregate, to sing loudly in daylit streets, to beat their repurposed bottles and spoons, to sound the percussive bass of recycled plastic drums. That right has already been won, and we will not regress. What now looks like defiance is the assertion many messengers have cried out and died for, many messengers indeed, including Walcott's fellow laureate, that other distinguished son, Sir William Arthur Lewis. Lewis also grappled with these themes and was recently honored in art with a doodle by Google appearing worldwide on December 10th, 2020. It is worth a small detour here to note that Lewis also held the view, and I quote, a new breed of West Indian needs a creative arts curriculum in secondary schools. A society without the creative arts is a cultural desert. If we are, to, if we are going to close our minds in a box of pure West Indianness, we shall achieve nothing worthwhile. So an inward myopia will never be enough. In that respect, the views of our two scholars are well aligned. In order to appreciate that treasure, which is the Caribbean, we must understand the provenance of that treasure. The term provenance is used in the art world to describe the origins of a piece, to verify its worth. Without such verification, a valuable object may be sold to a gullible novice who knows little and pays too much, or equally to a conniving speculator who knows much and pays little. At any rate, knowledge will always be power, and we deserve to have knowledge of ourselves. For as Mali says, in the abundance of water, the fool is thirsty. Walcott puts it well. Sadly, to sell itself, the Caribbean encourages the delights of mindlessness, of brilliant vacuity, as a place to flee not only winter, but that seriousness that comes only out of a culture with four seasons. So how can there be a people there in the true sense of the word? Sadly, we continue to dismantle the already incomplete understanding of ourselves. How else to describe the castration of so many aspects of our culture, the chronic underfunding of the arts, the archives, libraries, the National Trust, the Folk Research Center, the closure of museums and bookshops, the pittance spent on education, the pimping of cultural traditions into events. If we are not to be fools in our own house, and if we are not to be evicted, we need to understand our own provenance. In order to do this, we need history. We need all our fragments, all our languages. Inyere, Aruak, Lokono, Akan, Igbo, Hindi, Papiamento, Creole. We need to stubbornly trace our tributaries from source to surging sea. For as Walcott says, survival is triumph of stubbornness, spiritual stubbornness. Let us be stubborn then. I would argue that same stubbornness, that determination to survive and indeed to prosper, allows us to claim these tributaries as our own, as part of the geography and wretched history that has landed us here. And Walcott says this in the festival, says this of the festival, which he observes in the village of Trinity on the edge of Trinidad's Coroni Plain. He writes, I was entitled to the feast of Hussein, to the mirrors and crepe paper temples of the Muslim epic, to the Chinese dragon dance, to the rites of that Sephardic Jewish synagogue that was once on something street. I am only one eighth the writer I might have been had I contained all the fragmented languages of Trinidad. That 
entitlement is important because it empowers us to collect the scattered fragments that make us whole, to repurpose our pieces into a reassembled whole fit for the infinite possibilities of our own determination. This often quoted line is nonetheless fitting to this argument. Break a vase and the love that reassembles the fragments is stronger than the love which took its symmetry for granted when it was whole. We must see and we must assert ourselves as whole people, not as caricatures called taxi drivers, hotel workers, entertainers, all those obviating words which perpetuate a kind of economic anonymity. We must be whole people, whole lives, a whole nation, whole futures. Nothing edited by circumstance or market jargon into a pretty postcard. We need our assembled fragments in order to dance without losing our souls in the grand war of power and money and knowledge. Walcott's warning fully unfolds not just above us, but over the entire Caribbean when he writes, every day on some island, rootless trees in suits are signing favorable tax breaks with entrepreneurs, poisoning the sea almond and the spice laurel of the mountains to their roots. A morning could come in which governments might ask what happened, not merely to the forest and the bees, but to a whole people. Derek was torn for most of his life, torn between painting and writing, between bloodlines, between being just a red nigger who loved the sea, a nobody or a nation. He made an industry of it, not quite a seamless whole, which would have been just another unproductive stasis, but a tensioned bow in a celebration of memory and ritual and enigma, like an Asian arrow sailing over the village of Felicity. As much as his writing played lead, his painting was its twin, an alter ego in a supporting role. Consider Eddie Bohr's assertion that for a brief time he had hesitated between painting and poetry as his calling, but he never abandoned painting. His painter's eye for color and light informs his poetic descriptions and painting has been one of his themes. I raise this because I am at great odds with this modern practice of forcing children to choose between literature and language, between history and geography, between Spanish and French, between left brain and right brain, between one side or another of their soul, opting for banality instead of the ambidextrous, trilingual, creative exoticism to which we are so obviously disposed. What a scandal. And what use is this conversation if we are raising generations of compliant and in, an inquisitive, regurgitative people. By age 11, that damned and dreaded common entrance exam will determine which minds will be successful and which others simply not. Like so many of our development choices, this diminishes the imagination and robs us of that one most important attribute derived from our multicultural past, that potential to be mavericks, to be hybrids, to be exotic intelligences, surpassing the world's pejorative expectations of who we are supposed to be. And who will we be if we have no further use of history, or as Walcott asserts, the fragments of our own epic memory? Who will we be? And if Walcott achieved a distinguished excellence, it is because he did not flee from the discomforts of his internal societal or racial duality. Instead, he found ways to acknowledge, express, embrace, and sometimes briefly resolve his own fragments so that like the reassembled vase, his was a great, sad, triumphant love and memory, more precious than the broken original. It is therefore no surprise that Eddie Bohr claims with a sense of triumph, I think, that Derek will always figure commandingly in any consideration of the grappling with that legacy which has been a major contribution of his generation to Anglophone Caribbean writers. 
Through his imaginative emotion in great art, he has spoken to the major issues of his time of self and society. Figuring commandingly in the world is exactly what we must do. We must do. The wider Caribbean still looks to St. Lucia as a kind of mecca for the arts. We in St. Lucia are not exactly sure why, but they do. And what's more, if we look to the very pinnacle of achievement, we will see that there are worlds of fashion, film, art, design, literature, music, theater, and animation which would welcome art from us. The prize motivation, the official rationale for Walcott's Nobel Award by the Swedish Academy is instructive, and it reads that the prize is given, quote, for a poetic oeuvre of great luminosity sustained by a historical vision, the outcome of a multicultural commitment. His excellent writing was a given, but it was not enough. His sustained historical vision and multicultural commitment are equally rewarded. His embrace of fragments, in other words, reassembled, made whole, and globally relevant. We, too, have that potential. And when we speak of cultural industry, this should be part of the conversation. Raw, unformed talent flourishes briefly and flounders here every day. It is never going to be enough. What is soca without its carnival? Mere titillation. What is voice without its own story to tell? Imitation. What is symbol without substance? Nothing. If we do not reform soon, we will all be like Achille in Homerus, who returns to his ancestral home as a shell washed up on a shore. The edit conversation, which Derek will forgive me for taking some liberty with, the edited conversation between old world and new world runs like this. Afola Bey, the ancestral elder, says, in the place you have come from, what do they call you? Achille replies, Achille. Afola Bey says, what does the name mean? I have forgotten. Achille says, I too have forgotten. Everything was forgotten. The deaf sea has changed around every name that you gave us. Afola Bey responds, a name means something the qualities desired in a son, even a girl child, unless the name means nothing, then you would be nothing. Did they think you were nothing in that other kingdom? No man loses his shadow except it is in the night, and even then his shadow is hidden, not lost. Partial recall is not enough. Silent acceptance is not enough. And as I said to the hotel guard who wanted to search my car, I will not assist you in my own enslavement. It is not enough to forget and carry on. It is not enough to want a job and a mortgage. This small gathering of the few and the favored is not enough. And the pitiful sum devoted to the celebration of our two greatest sons can never be enough. Our thought, which provokes our art, our creativity, our cultural expression of deepest self should be as energetic as those actors I first admired. Aggressively uplifting and inspiring, first to us and then to others. We must shine as brightly as we possibly can. To do otherwise is to surrender, to imagine a struggle over which has not yet been won. George Lamming speaking about the castle, in the castle of my skin, one of his first novels, speaks of a tragic innocence to which it seems we are in danger of returning. He identifies, quote, a dimension of cruelty that seduced black people into lasting bonds of illusion. And I quote further, it was not a physical cruelty, it was a terror of the mind a daily exercise in self-mutilation, black versus black in a battle for self-improvement. This was the breeding ground for every uncertainty of self. 
George Lamming. It would seem that uncertainty of self, that terror of the mind is still with us and will only deepen if we continue to dismantle the already incomplete understanding we have of ourselves. Walcott is hopeful, and I quote, that deprived of, deprived of books, a man must fall back on thought, and out of thought, if he can learn to order it, will come the urge to record, and in extremity, if he has no means of recording, recitation, the ordering of memory, but Walcott comes to that truth with his sound colonial education and the luxury of being able to say, I read, I travel, I become. But that was never universal. Not then, and certainly not now. The struggle cannot be over. While I can recall one student at a nearby secondary school that shall remain nameless, telling me she didn't need to pass literature because it was theater arts she wanted to teach. Our allocation on tertiary education is a quarter of what other developing countries typically spend. We are underinvesting in research, innovation, and development. This is no secret, this is known. So it is entirely possible that we are only building two dimensional citizens, characters in the postcards we peddle to tourists. There is more to that process than benign neglect, our development strategy has failed to create conditions for advancement of our people in their own country. Indeed, by most indicators, we are under-delivering in all aspects of state responsibility, education, health, security, environment, social and economic infrastructure. With limited options, we are trapped in spirals of dependency. Here is Walcott's take. This is how the islands from the shame of necessity sell themselves. This is the seasonal erosion of their identity, that high-pitched repetition of the same images of service that cannot distinguish one island from the other, with a future of polluted, polluted marinas land deals negotiated by ministers, and all of this conducted to the music of happy hour and the rictus of a smile. With such limited internal prospects, we just end up exporting our brightest citizens to the very countries on which we already depend for trade, investment, aid, and debt. A single country is now our largest single creditor. That is Taiwan. More than 50% of our debt is held with one single country. Heaven help us if the politics of that nation changes. In essence, we are living a perversion of Sir Arthur Lewis's model of development. We are becoming trapped in a downward spiral of low wages, low growth, high debt, and high dependency. If there is anything sustainable in that formula, I will take a vow of silence now, and the state will be finally free of this meddlesome priest. Derek and many others have spoken of this for decades, but our outcomes will not change unless we alter our trajectories. So for those who want something new to be said, let them first admit that they have in their various positions of power, influence, and subterfuge done nothing to alter the narrative that they find so boringly repetitive. It is no crime to assert or admit that we need fundamental change. It is a crime not to pursue that change. So we cannot have superficial conversations. We cannot be afraid to speak about a love of self and a love of country as essential components to our economic prosperity. The irony of our times and the nature of the global marketplace is that it levels everyone and everything into clips and sound bites. It demands little of us beyond consumption and obedience and the occasional storming of the national capital. But we require thought. We require agency. We require determination as our defenses against that tyranny of the mind 
we can return to fundamentals. We can design a new humane economy. We can power our own restoration. Derek also believed that and expressed it in this way. Antillian art is the restoration of our shattered histories, our shards of vocabulary, our archipelago becoming a synonym for pieces broken off from the original continent. Kenny Anthony once said to me, and I asked his permission to repeat this. He said, Adrian, if you keep telling politicians they are the problem, eventually they will stop listening. And of course, he was right. So as I close, I want to dispel any notion that politicians are the problem. Indeed, I want to loudly proclaim that politicians are the solution. Better politicians, honest politicians, enlightened politicians, brave politicians who put their people first. That is the people who actually elect them, as opposed to the people who pay for their campaigns. I said earlier that I have great faith in the Caribbean consciousness, our ability to rebalance, our sense of when to correct, when to change course, or indeed when to change governments if they need changing. And if I am to keep that faith, I must also believe that even four dec decades later, our anthem is still right, calling us to love, oh love, our island home. I think it is instructive that our anthem begins and ends with love as a paramount ingredient. We need love to support, to survive, to prosper, whole, intact, conscious. So we must rediscover and reassemble that love of self, of land, of light. Because as Derek wrote, this gathering of broken pieces is the care and pain of the Antilles. Ladies and gentlemen, I close as I began with a recent piece from my manuscript, Inverted Islands. This piece, adapted from the script of the St. Lucia story, Petit-Zil, Grand Wave, Little Island, Big Dream, was commissioned for Independence 40 in 2019. I think it is apt to this evening's theme. Little Island, Big Dream. For this piece, I am accompanied once again, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Leston Celestin on guitar, Mr. Anderson Charles on flute. And the name of the piece is Said the Grio to Lucian. Dancing spirit, enough with whimsy, enough with wandering, as if this place does not already know you, love you, as if some other heart pulses in its palm, while you, a stranger, unbudding, ungrowing, without ancestries to anchor you, Wither to subsistence, sever inexplicably into some other seed. Enough. This cradling city, however poorly woven, out of reed and mangrove, recovered from charred timber and fire-broken stone, is made more precious by its rebirth in you. It kneels toward the sea, lays down its chronicles of loss and sacrifice in your name, inhales deeply at the edge water, 
matching the cadence of each unpromised lung full of your breast drawn into thinking stretched into speech made flesh with intent and reason by your enchanted footfall or accidental step soul to earth limb to torso torso to crown magnificently moving frame shimmering in the fiery noon in the amber sigh of street lamps leveling the tilting path lightening the ascending road these two are your bloodlines your tributaries silvering in noon's smile since your birth enough now man child dancing spirit enough it is you who must plant yourself into this new island earth enough 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 Ladies and gentlemen, you have been more than wonderful. Thank you very much. Exhilarating, uh, more than thought-provoking and, and quite poignant. Ladies and gentlemen, as I promised, both entertaining and stimulating. <laughs> I would now invite uh, you, as I know you have many, many points and themes from that lecture that you have mulled over in your mind. I would like to invite anybody who would wish to make a representation to uh, contribute to the discussion to the mic. Good evening, everybody. Um, Adrian, um, thanks for that. <laughs> I mean, I've followed the Derek Walcott lectures from ever since it began. And I see, from my point of view, this is one of the best I have heard over the years. <laughs> I thank you for that. There's much in there to inspire, um, to ponder upon, to provoke. Yeah, the lecture f right, feels to me like a, a necessary vaccination that we must have in more than two doses. <laughs> All of us must have uh, the necessary vaccination. Uh, and so, well, I call upon and I ask teachers, um, media people, and so on, to see how much we can spread a lot of this. Because I suspect the more we hear it, and hear it again, we will be seeing a lot of different aspects of it that are so important for us to try and unravel and understand. However, I want to be a little mischievous now and ask you, um, and I'm wondering what now, and it's, it's about what now. What, uh, to send you into some practical, practical spaces. Um, what is, I just want your advice on, what is the task for us, the people? What is the task for us, the people, in relation to our government? in relation to government, leadership, politics, 
And yes, at this point, it is about this government. Uh, so, um, for, I mean, no apologies to <laughs> Honorable Fortuna Bellrose, who is here with us, and I know, I know your honesty and your deep desire to do well, but I still ask Adrian if he can, <laughs> I, I don't know if you'll have direct advice, but if you can lead us in thinking on action now in relation to governments, because we cannot not do it. And I ask that in particular, because governments come and governments go, and no matter what you say, no matter how you put the politicians, as maybe not the problem as we seem it to be and so on, but government has been, and today I think is one of the biggest obstacles to us moving forward culturally and in a, and some of the directions that you are suggested. Because especially now, and I'm not the only looking at this government, government before and so on, they, governments have been the one cutting down on almost every achievement, step forward we make culturally, we have to come and, and, and cope and face and face the power of governments that just do things. And a lot of them you mention. A lot of them you mention. I want some one and I, I keep doing it. <laughs> I mean, I will not for the life of me understand how any government, you know, could have not done everything in their power to keep um, the imperial at Louisie and in the leadership of this country because of what she brought in relation to all of what you said about us as a whole people and us understanding it and moving forward with that kind of pride and so on is that head. Okay? Move. The, oh, the closure of Radio St. Lucia, the attack on, on National Trust. That you mentioned some or the other. I am not looking at this government in particular, but I'm asking you your advice. Very practical, yeah. if you have any, and you are a senator in government, <laughs> if you have any <laughs> on how do we relate, what is our task, and urgent in relation to government. Sorry. Do Dr. Oji, any? You know, Boots, I feel to do like Derek and tell you a bad word, you know. <laughs> but before I do that, I must thank you for something that you said, and maybe I can springboard off that. When I did um, The Spirit Moves Below, the costume that we saw on the screen that went to Taiwan, triumphantly the spirit moved below. You said something that, in your commentary that I heard in a later broadcast, you said um, this costume brings together Adrian, the writer, the poet, the artist, the costume mass man, and all that sort of thing. And I thank you for that, because you haven't always been my greatest fan. So I take it as an, as an honest um, endorsement. But it's, it points to what we are talking about, that we cannot have incomplete conversations with incomplete people. We have to start the process, and it's not government as much as governance that needs to change. We are having conversations with the wrong people in the wrong places at the wrong times, and the agenda is woefully inadequate. And this is the pattern that keeps repeating itself over and over and over again. If you're deciding something about my life, for Christ's sake, have me in the room. If we just do that, Woods, we will start to change the way decisions are made, the way we view ourselves and each other, and we will start to rethink this business of resource allocation because that is what it comes down to, what is important. And what is important gets decided by the people who are in the room and at the table. So if you're not at the table, you are not important, my brother. And that is how it works. And so sometimes we have to break down doors and we have to be impolite and we have to tell people about their murder because you, this is the only way you're going to get their attention. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our decision makers only understand embarrassment. It's really, really sad. And because it lowers all of us to have to 
to, to descend to that to get attention on issues which are national, which are broader than any one of us. And yet still we talk and we ask and we plead and we beg and, and it doesn't change because we're doing that from the outside. Um, the dilemma for a lot of us is that we don't want to get on the inside because what we see on the inside does not interest us. And as I used in my, in my, in my um, speech, the, 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 the problem is that you, you're asking something of us in which we have no interest. And that is often the case. Um, the only way that is going to change is to be in the room, in the conversation. We need to demand that. And we need to settle for nothing less. And that will begin to change the dialogue. The other really, really, really big thing that we need to do is to fix the education system. Um, it's, it's, it's a cause for tears, uh, but, the, but the example of the young lady that I mentioned who doesn't need to study literature because she's going to teach theater arts, that says everything. That says everything about the compartmentalization of our souls, of our bodies, of our minds, of our children. And we know the common entrance is a damned and dreaded thing, and we still will not take it out, even if the logic for it has long since disappeared because we do not need to ration school places. That's what it was made for, to ration school places, to select out the dumb from the bright. We can't be doing that in 2021, but we won't change. And it is the same way that we are going to send a batch of unprepared students up and out of the system come 2022, having not taught them in 2020 and 2021. We are going to graduate them out of the system and you will see them on the backs of lorries with their backpacks and their short pants and their slippers in their foot because that is all they qualified to do. 100% of my children don't live here. Why? We are not people without means. We are not people without options. We are not people without futures. Why? Ask yourself that. Where are your children? They're gone. So who's left? Who's left gives you the government that you have? Thank you. But I think, um, yes, some deep, deep thoughts um, provoked there by um, my colleague, Senator. But I think the important thing we must realize is that we have a country to run. Not a day to run it, but we have a lifetime, you understand, to participate meaningfully in what is happening in our country. And so we don't pick a season to be active. But we have to be civilians and be active in our country consistently. And even for me as Minister of Culture, I ask, where is the dance association? Where is the fashion association? Where is the artistic association? Where I keep asking, because for some reason, we have this problem of getting together to make things happen and to make the changes that we require. We need to come together as a people and Derek's work you know, clearly, based on what I heard this evening from him, depicts the confusion within ourselves as well, as citizens. We need to know what we want. And that is the only way things will change in this country. It will not change if we don't know what we want. And we have to be consistent in terms of what we want, and not dilly-dally depending on who is leading. We have to be consistent in terms of what we put forward. And we have to rally with that vision and that agenda. So I share your sentiments, but I think as a people, we have a lot of work to do. And Boots, you hit the nail on the head. We do have a lot of work to do. It's not just for the season. And we know it's the political season, so everybody's charged up. But beyond the political season, what happens? We just go back into our merry ways. We need to be consistent and manage and work with government to ensure that we get what is right for our country. But I'm happy to be a part of this government, having said that, because I think we are working systematically, you know, to ensure that we get the changes that we want in this society. And so if it means provoking you 
to get you to become active, that's fine. We need that. But stop sitting down and doing nothing. You need to rise up and take charge of your own destiny. We can do it. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Um, I would just like to ask a question to sort of stir the conversation with respect to um, the work of Walcott. Um, in your presentation, you spoke about this concept of the whole country. Um, I thought you would have touched on it, and I guess you moved in another direction. Is it that Walcott had this wholeness where in his work where he touched on every nook and cranny of St. Lucia? How does that translate into this concept of the whole country? I'm not sure I understand your question, Drinia. Um, the topic was a whole people, um, which goes beyond the physical um, limitations of space and place. And, but I did um, mention that the landscape against which we live certainly defines who we are. Um, you know that the natives have moved further and further into the hills and surrendered the beaches to the industry because in a sense that is what is required of them as responsible natives and they have moved and you know that there is an abiding resentment when we are followed into the hills and we are found in our secret green places which Walcott speaks about and we, we try to find more and more um, well, what he speaks about, our secret places, our secret green places, where we don't have to worry about the, the next hotel or the, or, or, or the bulldozer, for that matter. Um, and there is only so far that you can retreat in 238 square miles. Um, so that's one answer. The other answer, which I think you were touching on, is that, yes, Walcott, Walcott wrote about St. Lucia in its entirety, and that is one of the points I, I think I did make, that um, he spoke about it both in its physical dimension and its, in its spiritual dimension as, as a place that nurtures, that confounds, that, that breaks your heart and, and, and you know, makes you laugh and cry almost all at the same time. And, and I mentioned that also that that is the nature of a fragile thing, that is the nature of beauty, that it is fleeting, that is the nature of the carnival costume that lives for five minutes on the stage and there's no more on Ash Wednesday. That is part of, of of everything that is transient, but it, it, it doesn't make it less valuable. And, and I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little bit facetious here. Um, I remember somebody saying to me once, um, how can you spend hours and hours building a costume that it only lasts for two days? And I said, well, you know, we spend a lot of money chasing orgasm that only lasts for five seconds. So. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Uh, Adrian, I thought this was very enlightening. I've been to a couple of lectures on Walcott, maybe four, and truly it captured moments I spent arguing with Derek. It, what stood out for me, you, be, you were able to articulate that Derek was not trapped in this duality that is killing us in St. Lucia. Although he became part of that duality, two Peters, two Nobel laureates, he showed us that there are options, there are change, even for a small island. But what really stood out, and Boots captured it, this should not be a one month or just an evening. The way you were able to weave both Derek and Sir Arthur and their commitment to the arts. But for me as an economist and an artist, the options that they proclaimed readily, whether it was 
in his writing, whether it was in his art. When you spoke about Derek's art, it, it was very personal for me in that um, when we were transitioning in the marina, and I hope you allow me to, to say this, I met this guy painting an area of the marina we were about to demolish. And it's very symbolic, but there's a meaning towards this story. And I said, did you get permission to paint? And he looked at me and he said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And I, I went upstairs and I asked the security, who's this guy? I said, oh, it's, it's Mr. Walcott. I said, oh, it's Derek Walcott, okay. So the day went by and he came the third day and I went to him and I said, you know we're about to demolish this place. Was, I'm selling it. He said, you're selling this explicit to some Arab? What are you? You're not a red nigger? You don't know? You don't love St. Lucia? And that started our friendship. And he was so bold, he said, well, I'm painting this for you. You're going to have to buy this painting because after they demolish this, you're going to have to sit with it for the rest of your life to look at what you've done. I said, well, I have to do it. It's my man. He said, no. You don't just have to sell it. You could have bought it and you could have developed it and you need to be part of that change that you're selling to some foreigner. And in a strange way, he inspired me from then on. So I want to say, I want, I want to commend you and the CDF. Uh, I th this lecture needs to be played, but it also needs to, with your help and other persons, explained and discussed, especially the, the time you took to weave both De Derek's artistry and his vision, because I see a political vision coming out of some of these works, the way you were able to pull it out. So I must commend you once again. And it's very, very powerful. It needs to be played. I hope it's sent to all the media places, but also it needs to attract the attention of the kids at school, they need to hear this and celeb really celebrate his work. Thanks. Any other contributions? This was a brilliant presentation this evening. I think Adrian set up the stage for an educational, a cultural, economic revolution in this island, and I hope we all can live to see it and make it reality. Sorry. Um. Good evening, everyone. Adrian, I just want to echo the sentiments of everyone here that this was definitely, um, I think, the best lecture so far. This was awesome. <laughs> um, you mentioned the uh, children and, and culture and, um, and young people um, and uh, uh, being St. Lucian and, um, in a sense, losing that St. Lucian-ness. Um, and the, the beauty of a lot of Walcott's work uh, the way he was able to capture St. Lucianess, even using something like, you know, the English language, it's called the master of the English language, but he captured Creole St. Lucianess using English language. And we see a lot of young people uh, now actually not being able to understand that, not in a sense losing their St. Lucianess. There are young people who will be able to tell you more about the Vibes Cartel um, and you know, you say that we know Charles Cadet passed away over the weekend, and then you ask young, young people, tell you what, who's Charles Cadet? 
what, what is he known for? You know nothing about St. Lucians. Um, how do we move forward with these young people who are out there, helping them to understand what it means to be, I mean, really a, a St. Lucian? You know, understand all of these, uh, a lot of Walcott's work, a lot of everything that, that Walcott captured in his work. Um, and even, I mean, I, we understand that, you know, culture is something that's, that's dynamic. Their culture now is different from mine, from Walcott's way back then. But how do we move forward into this new culture with these young people, but still keep and maintain um, our St. Lucian-ness? Uh, thanks, Shane. Um, I think the great tragedy of where we're at is that there is a presumption of scarcity. We start off thinking that there is not enough and not everybody can have what they need. And when you really think about what people need, that's a false argument, that's a false construct. The problem is not money, the problem is management. We are people that can make magic with a dollar. That's not the problem. The, the tragedy is that they don't know who is Walcott and they don't know who is Kadeh, but they don't know who is Churchill or Hitler either, you know. They don't know who is Stalin, you know. They don't know much. And I would give you a simple statistic, and it speaks to our lack of ambition, our lack of where we want to position ourselves. The average GC student in St. Lucia does seven subjects, if that many. And I gave you the choices that they have to make somewhere around Form 1 and Form 3. So you're asking 15-year-olds, 15, 11, 12, 13-year-olds to shape their future. Instead of giving them a future that is so broad that they can shape later on to whatever they want. Um, that's one statistic about, about um, what, we, what we study here, seven, seven GCs, seven O-levels, seven CXCs. You can tell my age. Um, the average student in England does 14. How can we survive on half the education when we are already a day late and a penny short? And that is what it is. We have no vision of the, of the citizen that we want to make. Um, we do sports. We don't have a strategy for getting anybody on the West Indies team, not really, or getting anybody to swim in Olympics, not really, um, or getting our, pardon? It's true. It's true. We don't have a strategy. We have an intention. We have a wish. We don't have a strategy. We don't have a strategy for getting our music into mainstream America or UK or Africa or Latin America. We don't have a strategy. So we're going through the motions. We have reports, yes. We just did another one on, on, on um, rebranding re Carnival. It's, nothing's going to come of it. I'm sorry, but that's my expectation, that nothing will come of it, because we don't have the will. We're not serious enough about ourselves. And the real question for us as a society is, we made a flux once, we got Sir Arthur Lewis, we made a flux twice, we got Derek Walcott. We ain't getting a third Nobel laureate anytime soon. Prove me wrong. But we're not creating the base. Derek had an amazing education here. He learned Latin, he learned Greek, he learned English literature, he learned uh, European history. He knew the world before he left here. And if you read In a Green Night, his first publication, he is already dealing with global themes. He's already dealing with universal um, humanity. He's up there aspiring to be Auden and Keats and Shelley. And I'm not saying that's who we must aspire to be, but aspire to be as good as. And we don't have that, Shane. 
We don't. We really don't. Because we are operating in, a, in an illusion of scarcity that we are never going to have enough to do what we need to do. But the problem is not money, it is management. We are custom making magic of a dollar. But we forget and we get stupid. Judy, sorry, you were saying something. No, it's not. No, it's not. And, and if I could be so bold, I'd say maybe that's the last question. And Greek. And Greek. So did we change the strategy? At what point Let did we change the strategy? Okay, that's a good Why question. Why did we change the strategy? Did we not know something that... We, we changed the strategy because we operate in, in, an, in an illusion of scarcity. The Caribbean, the CARICOM ministers of education set the way back. 10 years, 15 years, maybe more than that, set the standards for, um, for education below development, developing country averages, um, teacher-student ratios, and such indicators of qualitative education. They deliberately and knowingly set them below developing country averages when we needed to leapfrog, when we needed to jump over and be ahead of. And we continue to do it. Why are we spending for the last, for more than 10 years, a quarter of what the developing world spends on education. Why? Why? But well, we can change that. Please. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We need to redivert some of the money that is going into pockets it should not go into and invest it in our children. It's as simple as that. It, but what are our priorities? It's as simple as that. Okay? So the whole budgetary process, which is a farce, because it's not driven by national long-term strategic objectives about where we want St. Lucia to be 10 years from now. Nobody's having that conversation. Nobody. And unless it's driven, unless the budgeting process is driven by that strategic vision of where we want the country to be, which is the same conversation as what citizen we want to occupy the country, then we will start to see a change. But our process of resource allocation is just wrong, and it has been wrong for a long time. And we, we're not doing anything to change the trajectory of the country. So poverty and illiteracy and disease and ignorance and, and bad roads are going to be with us for the foreseeable future. You tell me one thing we are planning to do that is different to change the major economic indicators under which we have been laboring for the last 15 or 20 years. You tell me one thing that we're doing. There's nothing wrong with that in my view. Um, we've criminalized a whole generation of people for this. Um, yeah, it's about time. Move on. Indeed, Thank Dr. you. Walking. Thank you, Dr. Oji. Thank you, Dr. Oji, and to the audience for a great evening. Um, the lecture in itself was, I can echo the sentiment, was the best that I have seen uh, in recent times. And uh, the discussions stemming fr from it were indeed even more so thought provoking. Uh, I will take the opportunity now to invite Mr. Tyrone Harris uh, to give a vote of thanks and to give some appreciation plaques. Is this? Uh, some, yes, Mr. Harris. Thank you very much, Mr. Master of Ceremonies. And I must say, um, ladies and gentlemen, can we once again give Mr. Dr. Oji a round of applause for a very well-delivered, well-researched um, lecture. I'm hearing that this was the best lecture um, from the lot that we've had so far from 1997. That's up for debate, but um, it was certainly a wonderful lecture. Round of applause for Mr. Oji again. You would have noticed that in our first um, 
introductory video, we, we presented the club of exquisite lecturers over the years. So at this point, I would like to reveal Mr. Um, Dr. Adrian Ogier's page. Um, <laughs> round of applause for Dr. Adrian Ogier for joining our lecturers club from 1997 to 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Her Excellency Dame Paulette Louisi, chairperson of the Sir Derek Walt, um, the Nobel Laureate um, Festival Committee, on behalf of the Cultural Development Foundation, and by wider extension, the people of St. Lucia, we would like to present Dr. Adrian Oji with this token of appreciation for having delivered the Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture 2021. And at this point, I would like to invite Sigrid Nama Walcott to present our token. And it reads, the Nobel Laureate Festival Committee St. Lucia expresses its sincerest appreciation to Dr. Adrian Ogier for presenting the 2021 Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture, Castries, January 19, 2021. <laughs> you want it to be then, of course, eh? Thank you very much and Adrian I hope you know that we did notice that you came decked out in your camouflage already for the revolution <laughs> from the socks to the inner shirt to the jacket power to the people <laughs> ladies and gentlemen it's time so that we could acknowledge some of the persons who work extremely hard in making sure ensuring that this tradition of the Nobel Laureate Festival um, um, continues and also the Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture. We'd like to thank um, Her Excellency Dame um, Paulette Louisi, chairperson of the Festival Committee, for con the continued hard work that um, herself and the committee um, puts and um, um, does to put this wonderful festival together every year and without relenting in the, this COVID 19 environment. Ladies and gentlemen, please say thank you to Her Ex Excellency and her festival committee. <laughs> of course, we want to say thank you to um, Sigrid Nama Walcott and the family of Sir Derek for the continued support um, for us present, um, presenting this very important lecture annually. <laughs> and our featured lecturer, Senator the Honorable, Dr. Adrian Oji, we thank you once again for a very well delivered lecture. We thank our Master of Ceremony, Mr. Dylan Norbert Inglis, the entertainers this evening, Rashad Joseph, and of course, the musicians who were accompanying Mr. Ogier, thank you very much. The National Television Network, Albies Media Limited, Pros Impact, Audio Works St. Lucia, SLU that is, Zenith Williams Design, the Department of, the, of Culture and the Creative Industries, Events Company of St. Lucia, the St. Lucia Tourism Authority, and of course, the management and staff of the Cultural Development Foundation. We also want to thank our sponsors, the Government of St. Lucia, the Office of the Governor General, Ministry of Tourism, Information and Broadcasting, Culture and the Creative Industries, 
the Ministry of Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, and the Public Service. We want to thank Honorable um, Senator the Honorable Fortuna Bell Rose for gracing, grac gracing us here this evening with her presence. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings to an end the 2021 Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture. And we want to thank you for coming. I see Mr. Kennedy has. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Ms. Boots, for your point. Um, so this brings us to the end of the 2021 Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture, and we invite you to please be safe on your way home and we will see you here next year 2022 thank you and let's not forget the sir arthur lewis lecture which is thursday right here in this room so um i, I guess it will be um by invitation and of course, the same medium will be used in terms of ensuring that it's broadcast through the wider um, St. Lucian community. So the persons who are invited, um, please ensure that you come. Thank you. <laughs>